treatment strategy, the RTSA Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancement webinar uh, hosted this morning. And just by way of introduction, I am Ken Connell, arborologist at Rainbow Companies. I've been with Rainbow for 23 years this year, and I'm also a ISA board certified master arborist and a tree risk assessment qualification certified arborist. Picked up that credential last year. I also serve as the adjunct faculty in arboriculture at Hennepin Technical College in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. My email is listed here, khonnell at rainbowtreecare.com. If you need to email me with questions later on, I'm good about responding to my email, so just feel free to use that email address. So moving on to our objectives today, what I'll be covering is the historical context of Dutch elm disease, as well as its pathology, biology, how the disease spreads and gets established. We will look at diagnostics for Dutch elm disease, and I'll relate that to other conditions that can look like Dutch elm disease or not, and how you can make those distinctions to clarify for yourself what's going on in the tree. And uh, we'll look at management strategies, kind of uh, relate them to that historical context I mentioned, like what we did in the past a long time ago versus what we do now as effective protocols. And a large part of that is the macro infusion process with fungicide. And we'll get a, just a quick overview of how that process is done. It won't give you the complete uh, ability to do that process, but it gives you the, the window into how it's done. In order to really be able to do macro infusions requires some hands-on training, but we'll give you an idea of what is involved in that. And while I'm looking at the uh, slide here on the objective, I just should address right up front, there was someone who had posted in an attendee about resistant elms. I don't really have much to say about that, so I'm just kind of doing full disclosure at the beginning that uh, with my experience, resistant elms, I've seen them die in spite of their resistance from Dutch elm disease, regardless of what variety it is, that they can get Dutch elm disease and they just put up a fight for several seasons and then end up dying anyway. Whereas a regular elm just dies in the matter of a course of the summer. So, you know, I don't really have a lot of in-depth information about resistant elms other than to say that resistance does not mean immunity. So moving on to the topic Dutch elm disease, why is it such a big deal? Well, because elms lined nearly every American boulevard decades ago, or in the earlier part of the 20th century, they were part of what formed this idyllic shaded cathedral kind of streetscape in many larger and smaller towns in the United States. And the elm was the ideal urban tree prior to the arrival of Dutch elm disease because it was resistant to soil compaction and salt and uh, smog and pollution, all kinds of things. The elm could just withstand all that stuff. And it grew quickly and made this really nice kind of vase-shaped cathedral shade covering over the street and became identified with kind of your quintessential small town look. But then when it arrived, it had a very devastating effect that uh, we now know, you know, it was introduced from Asia to Cleveland, Ohio in the 1930s with uh, global transport that was getting started in the previous century. And it was on logs from France. My first question was, well, what are we doing importing logs from France? We have plenty of logs here. But it was some particular kinds of burl logs with the figure in them when you cut thin slices of it. The veneer is very decorative. So there were some logs from France. and. The disease was named for the Dutch researchers who were first identifying and researching it. So a lot of people say, clients will say, I need to retreat my Dutch elm tree. Well, it's not a, a Dutch elm tree, like a species of a tree. It's that the disease was named for the Dutch researchers who were researching it early on. So early part of the 20th century, it gets established in North America. And by 1977, it had killed 77 million trees. I'll just look at uh, the local impact. I'm speaking to you from Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities area of Minnesota, and Dutch Elm hit us hard here in the 70s, as you can see on this graph 
1977, that peak year, Minneapolis lost over 30,000 elms and then over 20,000 elms the following year. And the loss rate dropped quite a bit, largely because a lot of the elms were gone. But Minneapolis still has a lot of elms, but it would just sort of stay at this under 5,000 or around 5,000 per year for a lot of years. Towards the end, you see that one uptick year of 2004. I remember that year that uh, we're speculating late season 2003, we had some stormy weather with hail and storm damage and suspect that beetles got into uh, wounds in trees and started late infections that then manifested later in 2004. But we still have elms in Minnesota and in Minneapolis because of the current day protocols and strategies. But it has been very devastating. And like a lot of different conditions, uh, an insect or disease will arrive on the eastern seaboard or further to the south and east of us. And by the time it reaches Minnesota, we've seen what works and what doesn't. And we get some plans in place to modify protocols and, and manage things to preserve our trees, hopefully. Now, the Dutch elm disease fungus, Aphiostoma nova omi, as it's called nowadays, the nova implies in Latin that it's new. So the original fungus that arrived here mutated or a new strain of it evolved along the way to be more aggressive than what was the original arrival. So the fungus got renamed from Aphiostoma omi to nova omi, so new Dutch elm disease. And the way it works in the host, in the elm tree, it clogs up the water conducting tissue, or basically the tree clogs up its own conducting tissue. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And the result is that the tree looks like it's dying of drought. When the conducting tissue is not working anymore, in effect, it is a drought manifestation. There's no water getting up to the full extent of the crown. So it establishes in the tree with a, a bark beetle, a species of beetle that, well, there's a couple species of bark beetles, a native and a European one. Either way, they will start feeding in two to four-year-old branches in these twig crotches. And they have spores of the fungus on their body that then transfer into the vascular system, into the xylem of the elm. Then the fungus spore germinates and it progresses in this narrow band until it gets all the way down to the root system. And there it goes systemic through the root system and rapidly kills the tree once it's down into the roots. Now here's the uh, tylosis formation. This is how the tree is trying to defend itself against the advance of the fungus. It's trying to restrict the movement in the xylem. And you can see these things in the picture called tyloses. They are sort of the balloon-like structures on the side of a vessel that expand or inflate themselves to block off that advance of some foreign agent in there. And if you're familiar with Al Shigo's work and description of the process of compartmentalizing injuries or wounds in trees, what this is is the first wall, wall one, that restricts the movement in the vertical dimension above or below a wound or some invasion. So tyloses blocking off that vascular tissue, that's ball one in Shigo's theory, if that fits into a context of something you're already familiar with as arborist. But unfortunately, the, the response is too slow. The fungus moves rapidly in that xylem, and the tree is shutting itself down, trying to save itself. And I have referred to it, uh, describing it to clients, like if I got an ear infection and I put a tourniquet around my neck to keep that infection from moving around my body, well, I would last maybe 60 seconds at best with the tourniquet on my neck, and that infection wouldn't spread around my body, but then, you know, the host is dead, so I lose. So that's essentially what ends up happening to the elm, the host tree. It kills itself trying to save itself. Now, I'd mentioned the bark beetle. There's two species, a native and a European bark beetle, that's responsible for 90% of the spread of Dutch elm disease because they inadvertently carry the spores of the fungus stuck to their body. But once it's established, Dutch elm disease can spread underground through interconnected root systems between elms of the same species. So an American 
to an American, a red elm to a red elm, et cetera. The overland transmission by the bark beetles starts when you have elm bark beetles laying eggs in dead elm wood with the bark attached. That interface between the wood and the bark is where they live and tunnel out these galleries or these little areas where they do their egg laying. Then as they emerge, they'll fly to healthy trees and feed on those two to three or four year old branches and say that wood in that wood pile in the picture was infected with Dutch elm disease. That's where they end up picking up the spores that are stuck to their body. They fly off to an uninfected tree, start feeding and get the infection established in there. Then that elm dies and it becomes a habitat for thousands more beetles to fly out and repeat the cycle all over again in the overland transmission. Once a tree is infected, then that possibility exists for it to grow down into the root system and moves into another tree with interconnected roots. So root grafts infect one another going down a row or into an area of interconnected trees. But in either case, if you're looking for symptoms, what you'll notice with Dutch elm disease is yellowing curling foliage and it's drooping and it starts to lose the leaves. And other elm stresses won't really have that droop or that curling, wilting look so much. I mean, we'll talk about a couple other things, but as the description goes on, you'll, you'll see how the distinction comes clear, like with that yellowing, curling, drooping, that becomes very uh, much a diagnostic form for Dutch elm disease. Now in this picture, you can see how an insect established, insect vectored case of Dutch elm disease will start from the top and move downward toward the roots. And in a normal uninfected elm, there shouldn't be yellowing or flagging that just affects one limb. If it's out in the full sun, that should be nice solar collecting area for that tree. But why is it just suddenly one limb starting to look odd like that. And then a week later, the next limb and the next limb until progressively that tree looks really bad and the city will come out and tag it in most cases. You know, they have uh, inspectors that are watching for this. But if you, you see one limb start to go and then it progressive, progressively moves to another in a pretty rapid manner, that's Dutch elm disease underway. So once we're suspecting Dutch elm disease, a major diagnostic feature we want to verify is the staining in the wood, that reaction from the tylosis formation. But staining in the wood is the brownish discoloration under the bark. And usually the fungus is out five or 10 feet ahead of where the staining actually is. So you're kind of reading the picture of where it's already been. But you'll get this uh, look at the staining by cutting a branch or a limb during in the place where the active infection is occurring and you can peel the bark. So always carry a good stout knife with you. It doesn't have to be a major knife, but a good sharp pocket knife can get the bark off. And you're not needing to whittle down into the wood. If you just score the edges of the bark and peel it off, during the growing season, it's relatively easy to peel that back and notice that staining. And a normal branch without an infection just has kind of a creamy or buttery color to it without those streaks in there. And if it's down in the main stem, that's where you can take a hatchet or an ax and just cut a window about two inches square, three inches square, something like that. Maybe pound it a little bit with the back of the hatchet to help release that bark. But oftentimes you'll be able to see that staining if it's a progressed case. You see it right in the main stem of the tree. Now, other conditions of elm that can sometimes get to be confusing when we're out inspecting elms. You know, our consulting arborist staff, all of the elms under their care for clients, they inspect their whole list every year, the ones that are coming due for retreatment. So we get very well versed in some of the other conditions that can look like Dutch elm disease. And the, one of them is this black leaf spot fungus, which is a non-lethal condition pretty common during moist years in elms. And you'll find it 
in the lower interior part of the crown. And when you see yellowing leaves, that's kind of a, a warning sign. But if it's just in that lower interior part of the crown, it's not extending all the way out to a limb in the sunny part of the tree, that's your cue that this is probably just a foliar fungus that's not adding up to any major problem for that tree. Now the name of it, black leaf spot, is aptly named. You can see the black spots in these leaves. And I couldn't find a good picture other than a couple of leaves I had pressed of this. But they'll kind of yellow and drop to the ground and have those spots in them. So again, contrast it with Dutch elm disease yellowing and flagging. That's going out to branch tips. This is just in lower shaded interior parts of the crown. Then elm yellows, I figured I had to speak a little bit to that. We don't really have that up here in Minnesota. So I haven't had uh, experience with it, but just to give a little bit of attention to that, it's caused by a mycoplasma-like organism. And leaf hoppers, this insect vector it around. Often these fungal diseases or other types of diseases that get into trees, they're moved around by insects of one kind or another. And it's similar to Dutch elm in that it can spread through root grafts. And the leaves turn yellow and drop prematurely, like Dutch elm disease. But the distinguishing factor here is the whole crown shows symptoms at the same time. It won't be a progressive dieback, like first one limb, then another, and then several limbs, and then the whole crown in a progressive manner. With elm yellows, it's kind of all at the same time. But the end result is the same. That tree just needs to be removed. So by the time you identify that, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot else to do with it. But uh, with some of these other conditions that I've discovered and learned to identify over the last handful of years would be pit canker of elm. It's a Phytophthora type of canker. And I think we've been overlooking this for a long time and misdiagnosing it as Dutch elm disease without really uh, realizing we need to take a further look at some of the trees. And in the picture, you can see those cankers. These were bigger than a dinner plate, really. They're kind of large, elliptical, sunken cankers. And what makes it tricky to detect sometimes at a glance is that bark will adhere over the surface of these cankers. So you don't really see it. And you might not notice unless you're just kind of tapping around with a mallet or some kind of an object. And you sense the difference between sound wood and intact bark and something that feels kind of loose or mushy on there. And you can pull a whole plate of bark off from that and find the canker down below that. So, if you've got multiple cankers on an elm tree, that's going to disrupt the direct transfer of that xylem to the crown and could reduce the effectiveness if, if you're doing fungicide injections because that conductive ability is disrupted. Now, a note I put in here as well is this could be a nectria or a phytophthora causing that. I just kind of view that distinction as academic. Um, Plant pathologists would debate me on that, and they would look at spores or culture it or something. But just from a practical arborist standpoint, a canker is a canker. There's no direct treatment of it, but you have to be aware of it in that it's going to have an effect on the maybe the structural stability, but definitely the ability of that tree to conduct fungicides into its crown to prevent Dutch elm disease from getting established in there. So here's another picture of the same tree up in the crown with this Phytophthora canker. As those cankers coalesce, and there's multiple cankers, that tree is going to start to lose vigor and look like, obviously, something's going wrong with it. And I believe there's a number of cases of this where we've misdiagnosed it as Dutch elm disease and thought it was a failed treatment of our uh, injections. But if you look at this, it doesn't really look like a Dutch elm kind of dieback. The twigs way up in the crown there, they have kind of like a rough, chunky look to them. The fine twigs have died back far enough back in time where they've shed from the tree, but they're still green dispersed out there, where it looks like a slow, progressive dieback on that over a period of a number of years, where Dutch elm disease would 
rapidly kill that tree off in the course of one summer. So if you're seeing this kind of a look with chunky branches without twigs on them and it's been slowly losing vigor, that's not going to be Dutch elm disease. This is some other kind of decline syndrome with Phytophthora or other kinds of uh, opportunistic fungi or insects working on it. But check the stem of a tree like this, tap on it, feel if you can find hidden cankers with the bark that's adhered over it on the stem. And in all likelihood, you'll find some kind of a big canker underneath there. Now if I uh, turn towards the history of the Dutch elm disease management, we've got some old time pictures here. They're kind of ominous looking actually. And I pulled a book off my shelf. It's the USDA 1949 Yearbook of Agriculture. And that edition of the USDA handbook was dedicated to trees. And it was very interesting because at that time, Dutch elm was a relatively new arrival. It had only been around for 10 or 15 years. So we didn't really know what to do about it at that point other than try to control the beetle vectors of the disease. The beetles were known at that time to be how it moved around. So the approach was here a direct quote, feeding by bark beetles can be controlled by completely covering the bark surface with an emulsion type spray containing 2% of DDT. So we know now after Rachel Carson and Silent Spring and all of the aftermath, what happened with DDT that is not going to be something that we want to have around in the environment. Although at the time, DDT was really the breakthrough thing. Like people would spray their farmhouses down with DDT and bed bugs were gone overnight. That was the story my uncle related to me about when DDT came out. But later on we found out you know, there's all kinds of effects through the ecosystem that we don't want to have with DDT. And as it turned out, spraying to control the beetle vectors didn't work very well anyway. Reasons being, well, there are thousands and thousands of beetles, and you can see how tiny they are just by comparing them to the lead in that pencil there. They're about the diameter of a pencil lead or even smaller. And all it takes is one of them to feed in that twig crotch of an elm to get the disease established and the disease starts all over again. And it's impossible even with DDT to kill all of them because there will be some hiding under a bark crevice or maybe they're developing resistance to your pesticide, your DDT, or there might be thousands of them off in some wetland or a woodlot where you weren't spraying and you're never going to kill all these vectors. So it ended up not being a very good strategy to try to control the disease. So they stopped doing that before too long. And eventually our strategy evolved into what we do nowadays. The Dutch Elm Disease Management Protocol sort of divides out into the wider general population involved intensively scouting, identifying disease trees, and checking yards for elm wood every four weeks. That would be something like your your local municipality, at least in Minnesota, it's a, a state law that communities have to have a staff of tree inspectors that are going around checking for elms that are dying of Dutch elm. But even if, if you have a wood pile with elm wood in it, that's a place where beetles can hatch out from that. You know, lots of people are not really thinking it through. They remove their infected tree. This happens with oak wilt infested trees too here. That uh, they think, well, here's a great opportunity to have some firewood, and they just stack it up in their yard. But then they become kind of Dutch elm disease central with thousands of beetles hatching out, moving it all around the neighborhood. So we would have uh, inspectors of Minneapolis and all the surrounding communities that are just scouring neighborhoods for this to find these trees. And then you get a notice. If you have a dying elm, you get a notice in the mail saying you've got three weeks to remove it. So there's actual ordinance on the books about that. Then sanitation is that next step, that you have to promptly detect and remove those diseased elms because they become a huge habitat for propagating more beetles. So if you scrub uh, areas in remote 
you know, corners of your woodlot or et cetera, it's, it's not practical to eliminate every infected elm, but at least in cities where they've got control over it, it makes a big difference. Then if you're looking at the individual trees, just the ones in your yard, then you look at severing root grafts or disrupt that uh, transmission through common roots. <clears throat> so you can eliminate that possibility of the underground transmission. There's the possibility of isolation and tracing or physically cutting out the infected portions of the tree. So just on the surface, that sounds really promising, like, hey, can't you just cut it out of the tree? Yes and no. Um, I'll talk in a little more detail about that. If you catch it really early, it's possible. But in general, people don't catch it anywhere near early enough to do that. The, the real bedrock of our protocol for managing Dutch elm disease is to protect the valuable elms ahead of time as a preventative with the macro infusion of fungicides. That's something we've been doing for decades very successfully. And it's much better to be ahead of the curve with Dutch elm disease. You can't really, in most cases, treat an existing infected tree, but you can very effectively preventively treat them against Dutch elm disease with macro infusion. So again, just kind of to put it into simpler terms, sanitation, detection or removal, isolation, disrupting the transmission through common roots, tracing if you cut out the infected portions, and then protection through fungicide infusions. So with sanitation, you have to be on it right away can't have a bunch of dead elms standing around propagating beetles because then if you get them out of there, the habitat is greatly reduced and you have less pressure on the remaining elms that are in your population of the urban forest. Isolation, cutting through the connected roots. One uh, important note here is the fungicide macroinfusion won't do anything to protect against transmission through the root graft. So it becomes very important to uh, account for this. The picture on the left, the blade of that machine, the vibratory plow, is inserted down at least four feet into the ground, so you can't see it there. And it's just a machine that's made to vibrate up and down with this blade that will sever any root connections there. And it's a machine that's very effective, but in a way designed to destroy itself. Now, most engineers are designing vibration out of machines. Well, this is a machine that is supposed to vibrate, so it spends pretty much as much time in the shop being repaired as it does out on site for severing uh, root grafts with Dutch elm or oak wilt cases. But it could also be done with a ditch witch, a kind of a excavation thing like you'll see on the right. It makes a little more mess in a yard, but you have to put that soil back down into the trench, but it can be done that way as well. Those trenches should be three feet deep in clay or five feet deep in sand, depending on the soil that you have. And it's not always practical to do the trenches, depending, you know, maybe you've got a steep slope or a densely wooded area or a lot of hardscapes, boulder walls, things that get in the way. It's not always practical to do that. But in my experience, most yards that have really nice elms are ones that have wide open flat lawn too, so you can usually get in there and do some trenching. I contrast this with oak wilt, where lots that have oaks tend to be more wooded, sloping, rugged areas, or they've got landscaping in, in the way. So I've been able to get trenches in on elm sites much more readily than on oak wilt sites. And a note here too that's important is disrupt the root graft before removing your diseased tree. The reason being, if you think of the tree as uh, the vascular system as like a big column of straws, and they've got this liquid in them that's infested with a fungus, if you cut that tree down, then that stump is just going to have air sucking into it, and then the, the roots with that infected fungal material will just suck right into the root graft of the next tree even more rapidly. So the best way to go about that is first disrupt the root graft, then cut down that tree 
so that when that uh, cavitation of air entering that xylem happens, it's not just going to rush it into the next tree. So you can't always know exactly if you got there with the trench before it already jumped into a root graft, and that's always the risk. But you make your best estimate of, of where you think that fungus might be when you place your trench in the ground. It's always kind of an art form on every site, which is different, to decide where to place a trench. Uh, that's maybe a subject of a whole webinar right there. But one thing to remember, disrupt the root grafts first before doing any removals. And you can save yourself having that root graft jump even faster. Now to the very enticing idea of tracing or cutting out infected parts of a tree. This works in some cases where the tree is very closely monitored and the Dutch elm disease infection is caught very early, like the very first tips of a limb starting to flag out. Um, by the time a whole limb is looking flagged or with symptoms, usually it's too far progressed. It's gone into the trunk and the roots and it's just a matter of time until the tree is killed and you can't really confine it at that point. But if you can determine where the entry point is out in that far end of a limb and then follow the disease down, what we do is with a climber or someone in a bucket truck, they cut small windows in the bark and peel off sections. And we're just looking for that staining to try to determine how far it's gone. And the staining can lag 5 to 10 feet behind where the fungus actually is. So we find the end of that stain and continue this pattern of cutting windows 10 additional feet past that. And then they kind of plunge the chainsaw in to sever off that xylem. And in effect, we've compartmentalized it. We're, we've been sort of doing a artificial compartmentalizing of that fungus to keep it from spreading through the rest of the tree. I've seen this work effectively, again, with trees that a homeowner is very closely monitoring because it's their prize tree. And the tree that I most recently saw was kind of a, looked like a big bouquet of flowers with a lot of different stems on it. And it could afford to lose a stem without looking too misshapen. Whereas a lot of elms, if you lose a major limb, that's about a third of your tree. And it's going to look really weird and ugly. But in this case, we had both uh, aspects working in our favor, early detection and a tree structure with long, skinny limbs, like a 40-foot long limb, had to come off this tree. And that tree is still there because we were able to isolate it. A 40-foot long limb gave us plenty of room to work with to trace and get 10 feet. So if we end up with the, the fungus going too far, too fast, and it gets down into the main trunk, and it's within 10 feet of the ground, then we just figure it's not salvageable because if it's less than 10 feet of uh, clear wood before the ground, it's probably gone systemic into the root system and it's just going to take the tree down in short order. So yeah, we need 10 feet of clear wood. And again, stressing this is successful only in very closely monitored trees. Most homeowners are not really attuned to trees that closely to catch this in time. I mean, in order to trigger a phone call from someone who hasn't been really versed in this or following their trees closely, that tree is pretty advanced. And you're, you're not going to save it with tracing. And here you can see that standing right down to the ground level, not a, sal a salvageable tree at that point. Now on to macro infusion. This is really our bread and butter, as I said, as far as um, managing Dutch elm. The selected specimens that you want to keep around, your front yard trees, the elms, the big old legacy trees, we can keep these looking good with uh, macro infusion. And what a macro infusion is is basically just a rapid introduction of a large volume of solution of fungicide right into the tree's vascular system. Just keeping in mind, again, it only takes one beetle to start an infection. So that large volume of fungicide, we want it to be delivered as evenly as possible throughout the crown. Because once that beetle starts to feed, if the fungus establishes in there, 
we can't really save that. So it has to have fungicide distributed through that whole xylem of that crown in order to ward off the effect of the, the beetle feeding in there. Our go-to fungicide is Arbitect 20F, used as a root flare injection, and it's 26.6% thiobenzidol fungicide, which has been researched and field proven for over 20 years. And it has a good ability to move into new sapwood in sufficient quantity so that the trees are protected for up to three growing seasons after the injection. So the basic steps are when you do this work, a tree inspection, then you excavate around that root flare, drill holes and put in these hardware tees and they get hooked up with uh, tubes to connect them all. And you begin your infusion and start mixing the chemical and monitor it to make sure everything's proceeding smoothly. And hopefully on a nice uh, warm July day, that takes 45 minutes to an hour and a large elm is all done. And then you pull out the teas and clean it up. So a tree inspection, this is the basic beginning of any process you know, for tree climbers or doing diagnostics. It all starts with a tree inspection. So our crews, before they do a macro infusion, are trained to do a thorough inspection for disease. And if they find anything that looks remotely suspicious, they'll hold off on doing the injection and get a couple more sets of eyes on it to determine what's going on or what response should be uh, deemed necessary for it. Because again, if, if it's root grafted, the tree is not going to be saved by that anyway, or if it's already infected at an advanced stage, it won't be able to save that tree. Now, inspecting the tree, if there's other health issues going on too, especially decay in the root collar area, then it shouldn't be treated because it won't probably have good uptake at any rate. Uh, we really depend on healthy root flare tissue for being the point at which the fungicide can enter the tree and get distributed into the crown. So while you're infecting the tree, you can start filling the reservoir, the big bucket, with water and determine what dose you need to put into that tree. So if there's stuff like armillaria on the tree, on the root flare, that's obviously fruiting bodies, that tree is going to look so poor to begin with, um, you know, I'd question why you're trying to in protect it with uh, fungicides in the first place. But, you know, it's just a good practice to start from the ground up with your tree inspection. Then you excavate and clean the root flares. Usually that's with a trowel and a whisk broom or a shovel for the larger areas. And we go to about 8 to 10 inches below the top of the root flare. We have three reasons behind uh, the reasoning for that. And one is that you get superior lateral movement of the chemical when you put it into the root flares. It moves through the trunk more evenly. And you'll get faster wound closure than the trunk tissue. It just seems like more responsive meristematic tissue in that root flare than up in the trunk. That a year later, you could see the drill hole, but it's already calloused over very quickly. And as that root flare fans out, it gives you a greater surface area to place the tees into. So you can concentrate more stuff into an area that's going up through the trunk. The trunk kind of is a bottleneck, so it lets you get past that bottleneck, so to speak. Now here's this, I like this cross section of a tree that shows how sapwood is a wider target in the root flare and how that results in a better crown distribution. That up in the stem, that conductive xylem is narrower, but sapwood tends to thicken and, and widen out there. So you can you get a, a better ability to put materials in there that will concentrate and distribute. So we're excavating and cleaning the root flares. Be careful not to damage those root flares. You don't want to end up causing an opening where armillaria or something could get in there. So the finer tuned cleanup of that root flare or opening it up is the trowel and the whisk broom. Now it's certainly possible if you have an air spade and you have a bunch of trees on a site you want to do this to, um, you could 
do the excavation with an air spade and do it quickly and with no injury to that root flare. But in a lot of cases, you've got one or maybe two trees on a site and your air spade is probably busy doing other jobs, doing other things. So it's not like you have an air spade just to clean root flares for macro infusion cases, but it would be a possibility if it's available, save some labor and get it done very quickly and effectively. Then you drill holes into that root flare, try to get perpendicular to that root flare surface, and you go one inch past the bark into the xylem. It doesn't need to be super deep. It's not going to be helpful to be super deep because really the conductive area you're looking for is just under the bark. So, you know, drilling extra deep won't really help you get more into the tree. And about every four to six inches around that root flare is the the way to space them out to get even distribution. And don't drill into uh, dead tissue. It's compartmentalized anyway, and it won't respond. It won't be doing any uptake. And deep valleys or sunken areas, you probably don't want to drill in there also. And spinning the bit in the holes, if you have a dull drill bit and are spinning it rapidly, that won't end up uh, doing much for you either because well, I think we'll talk about that. It sort of creates a friction that cauterizes the xylem vessels and the holes don't really take up then. It doesn't absorb the fungicide. And don't push the T's in too deep. Here you can see how that uh, hole was drilled to just below the bark level, about an inch below. And if you need to tap them lightly with a mallet, you can do that. But the picture shows where that xylem is and that little perforation in the side of the T is just that to deliver the material right into that xylem where it's going to be taken up. Then once you've got the T's in place and they're all, you know, it's all rigged up with these plastic tubes, you can start the infusion and the pump gets going at 15 to 20 pounds per square inch. And you mix the, <coughs> excuse me, the fungicide with water. And in the case of Arbitec, it's 12 ounces per five inches diameter of tree. And that each ounce goes with a half gallon of water. And don't reduce the amount of water because that will help you uh, reduce the possibility of phytotoxic reactions that sometimes happen with elm. Some trees react with some leaf scorch, especially on the trunk sprouts, that kind of thing. But we've never killed an elm with that and it's not super common, but um, don't reduce the water. The water is the vehicle that carries it up into the tree. Then once the tree is absorbing, taking the stuff up, check for leaks along in the tubes if anything needs to be fixed or replaced or tightened, and keep that pressure consistently at 15 to 20 PSI, and at that point, you can start putting away other equipment or maybe you're excavating the next tree in the row if you've got multiple ones on that property. And on a warm midsummer day in Minnesota here, 45 minutes to an hour for a big tree to take up all that stuff. So you've got maybe 30 gallons of water in a big Rubbermaid bucket with the fungicide mixed into it. In 45 minutes to an hour, that's all just pumped up into the tree. Now I say the the pump at 15 to 20 PSI, it's not that we're actually injecting it into the tree, that's just moving it from the bucket to the root flare and the tree is pulling it in through capillary action. So that's one thing to keep in mind why on a warm day the tree is really transpiring rapidly and it's that transpirational pull that's pulling it into the xylem stream. Our pump is just delivering it to the root flare so it can do the uptake on its own. Then when it's time for cleanup, you pull out the tees, but don't put any kind of waxes, putties, plugs, or pruning paint or sealers, any other kind of substance into those holes because the tree needs the oxygen there to start the compartmentalization process on its own and any of those other kind of foreign agents are just preventing what the tree is trying to do on its own and do its sealing process by its own uh, activity. 
you can replace that soil and sod and all your materials can go right into that 30 gallon trash can for easy transportation. So pitfalls to the macro infusion. I mentioned this, if your bit, drill bit's not razor sharp, then the tendency is to want to spin and push it and then all you're doing is causing a cauterization of the tissue in that hole and that will seal it off to where the fungicides won't move into the tree. If you change that bit every five to ten trees, it just saves you a lot of work and drill bits are not that expensive. Just switch them out and, and keep moving. Yeah, the drill bit is fun in the hole, cauterizes the xylem. And T's not placed onto the root flares. If you go up into trunk tissue, it's, it's not going to get that same kind of lateral distribution and you don't get the opportunity to put as many T's in because the root flare fans out, gives you more surface area. Or the T's are not spaced correctly. Sometimes you need to kind of bridge up and over a root area that's been damaged or compartmentalized. So you need to get creative in some of these cases. I've seen where we've bridged up and over into the callus tissue around uh, damaged roots. So you do what you can, but get them spaced out as best you can at four to six inch intervals around that root flare. Or the teeth are pounded in too far. They might be down below where there's actually conductive xylem. So no need to get real aggressive about it. Or the teeth get clogged up. You know, keep something around like a paper clip so you can just kind of clear the obstructions from there if it's dirt or wood fragments in there, just a, a little quick cleaning out is a good way to get things going again. Or if you've got unequal pressure inside the harness, uh, that's something you know that an experienced practitioner figures out how to uh, equalize that with a little bit of practice. So in review, just wrapping it up here, um, Dutch elm disease history got here in the earlier part of the 20th century and by the 70s was wiping out millions of trees. Um, vascular fungus moves around by insect vectors and gets established in the vascular system and the tree doesn't have a response that's fast enough to block it off. So it just continues to uh, shut itself down trying to stop the disease. DED compared to some of its lookalike conditions like elm leaf spot, you're going to see that in the lower shaded interior part of the tree. It's just a foliar infection, not a vascular infection. So in the whole scheme of things, not harming the tree much at all. Whereas the Dutch elm is out to the farther ends of a limb and progressive dieback of the whole crown. And that phytophthora canker will disrupt your vascular flow and it's more of a slow progressive decline of the tree, not a rapid one like Dutch elm disease. Then the management strategies, uh, you know, really early detection, sanitation, removal of infected elms to reduce beetle habitat, root graft disruption. In a few cases, tracing isolation and root limb removal. If you catch it early, that can work. Uh, but really the bedrock of it, of what we do, is the preventive injections with fungicide. So we went through the basics of that macro infusion process, but again, to learn how to really do that, you need to do it with hands-on training. But this gives you the basic overview of how that process works. So open for questions here. We've got a few minutes left, 10 minutes or so. We could field some questions, or you can always email me at the address posted here on this slide. So do we have any questions coming in? No? OK. Oh, I must have uh, been very thorough then. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for attending. Again, uh, shoot some questions to me if they come up later.